Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see everyone today. It's another exciting day, and I'm glad that you're here. For those of you online, glad that you're here as well, as uh, we have the opportunity for fellowship together with one another and with the Lord. Would you stand with me, please? We'll pray and then uh, continue our worship. Thank you, Father, for every blessing you pour out upon us, for our family, our friends, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Father, that we can draw near to you this day. Thank you for being with us, that we might celebrate what Jesus has done for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first song this morning that we're going to lift up to him is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Thank <laughs> you. 
if you can sing this from your heart, that if you have God as your Lord, Jesus as your Savior, that you can sing, it is well with my soul. Even when difficult days come, you can still say, it is well with my soul because God's on my side. Praise God. Yeah. 
Good morning, church. Good morning. We got any sound here, Dave? <laughs> Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He has redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Colossians 1, 21 through 23 tells us that we are enemies of God because of our behavior. But Christ paid the penalty through his death on the cross to present us holy in God's sight, free from accusation, but we must continue in our faith, hold to the hope that we have, hold to the hope of the gospel that we have, which brings salvation. As we get ready to partake in the communion, let's remember that the bread represents Jesus' broken body. The juice represents his blood shed on the cross for our sins. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ who came as a sacrifice for us, shedding his blood on the cross, giving his life for us so that we may have eternal life with God. Father, may you bless the emblems. May you bless the person that's taking these emblems, Father. And we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. offering is from the book of James chapter 1 verse 17 every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows everything that we have is from God as we keep hearing that week after week as we show our thankfulness by giving a portion of that back to God as our part of our worship let it be pleasing in his sight let your gift be pleasing in his sight let's give God the glory and the praise he deserves as you worship him let's pray dear Heavenly Father we thank you that you've given us everything that we have. Father, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver as we give a portion of that back to you, Father. We thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, kids, go ahead. And uh, hopefully some adults with you. Kids, kids might not mind one way or the other. I'm not sure. But, uh. <laughs> A couple of announcements that will flow into our prayer time. 
a week from Friday, it will be March. Can you believe that already? Yeah. Actually, a week from Wednesday, it'll be March. But March 3rd is Friday, and that's our next Defending the Faith class. And so if you would like to join us for that at 6 o'clock here or by Zoom, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, there have been very good discussions and uh, topic points and, and uh, some interesting learning. And so uh, Defending the Faith is March 3rd, 6 o'clock. That's our next class. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have a guest speaker. Yes, Dave? Oh yeah, yes, thank you. If you would like a Zoom invitation, we need your email and we need to know that you're interested. Uh, we send them out to a number of people that we know are typically more interested in the classes and whatever that we do. But we'd love to invite you if you are gonna join us by Zoom. Oh, waiting to Abiel, I see. I, I'm watching Dave wave back there, it's like, what, what did I forget now? <laughs> Okay, well good. Uh, next Sunday, David Poling, a missionary to China, is going to be here. Uh, he and his wife Lynn have lived in Hong Kong and traveled into China for decades, probably 40 years. And a uh, great, great story about them and about uh, the work that they do. You don't want to miss it next week. So Dave will be uh, preaching uh, during the morning worship service. And while we're talking about missions, we, we receive... Uh, newsletters from a lot of the missionaries that we are aware of, some of the ones that we support. Uh, Waypoint Ministries uh, is a church planting organization and church support organization. Um, frequently, uh, I've gone to webinars that they've done and seminars that they've uh, set up and that kind of thing. But uh, this is kind of a almost an annual report type of thing because they're talking about, and, and by the way, we support Waypoint uh, financially uh, through our missions program. And uh, this last year, they had 463 baptisms in the various churches that they've planted um, over the course of uh, a, a number of states. Um, Waypoint used to be Virginia Evangelizing Fellowship, used to be only in Virginia or primarily in Virginia. Now they're uh, working in six different states. Uh, in this uh, mid-Atlantic region, from Maryland down to South Carolina. Looks like a little bit of Tennessee as well. So it's a great opportunity for us to help grow God's kingdom even outside of our area. And, and there's lots of other facts and figures in here. Um, I'll leave this up here if anybody's interested uh, in, in looking through that. Uh, we'll probably get at least one more copy of that coming up. But... Uh, what I want to point out is that when, when we give our money in the offering, that some of that money goes to missions. 10% of our, our, our regular offerings go to missions. And, and they go to places, well, around the world potentially. Uh, right now to Albania, for example, to a, a church work there. In the past to India and, and other countries, sometimes short term, sometimes long term. And so the, the offerings that we give are intended to build God's kingdom here, but also around the world. So thank you for what you do in giving and supporting. And, and giving financially is not the best way that we support these missions. Uh, praying for them as well. And so lifting up Waypoint Ministries and, and uh, Mid-Atlantic Christian University and Camp Rudolph and the Albanian Mission and Luke Boys Ranch and uh, out in Missouri and, and like that. So there are just lots of opportunities and, and that's what we want to build upon uh, here. Uh, let's, while we're talking about praying for missions, let's go ahead and look at our prayer list. And you can see a number of, of prayer opportunities here. I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of them. But uh, one that was added kind of late was a reminder to pray for those in Syria and Turkey with the um, massive earthquake. And I, I don't know what the, the death toll is up to. It seems like it was over 30,000 last I heard. And isn't 41 now okay? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, if, if anyone would like to give money toward that help, there's an organization called AIDS, International Disaster Emergency Service, that 100% of the money that is given for a cause goes to that cause. And uh, most organizations can't promise that or don't do that, but AIDS does. So if you're interested in that, let me know. We'll, we'll figure out how to get you in contact with them. Uh, you can see uh, other opportunities for prayer. Uh, definitely a praise for food pantry and clothes closet yesterday. And one of the things I love about food pantry and clothes closet is that it's connection with our community. It's caring for our community. And uh, you know they don't, they don't know that we're sitting here in church right now, but they knew that we had help available to them yesterday. Okay, so apples and onions are available, and uh, please take them before they, uh, you know, turn into a gang or a mob or something. <laughs> you, know, you hate when fruits and vegetables have gone bad. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, what other prayer needs do we have, or what other praises do we have today? Yeah, continue to pray for Annabelle's uncle. Um, he's in, in the end stages of cancer. And uh, of course, God, God does miracles. So continue to pray for him. Pray for that family as well. Yeah, so continue to pray for Meg's cousin and, and family. Um, it really points out that the emotional part of diseases like this is as bad or worse than the physical part, you know, if she's already struggling, yeah. Yeah, Paco? I just want to thank God for the day. I want to thank God and praise Him for every breath, every heartbeat. For watching all of us on the track, we're still here. I want to thank God for the church. I want to thank God for the next meeting. I also want to thank God for all our demons, for all our five churches and then some supernatural, some have, yeah. some don't. Yeah. And I just want to thank God for his word. Because the Bible says, man does not live on bread alone, but by any word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yeah. And I just want to thank him and give him the highest praise because he is worthy. Mm -hmm. He is worthy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paco. Yeah, so much to, to praise God for. So much. Yeah, thanks. Father, thank you that you are with us and that you bless us. Help us to open our eyes to see the wonders that are all around us. Father, we, we pray for those with illnesses and uh, those who have lost loved ones. And, and there's so many physical things that impact us. But Father, help us to, to look to you for... Uh, for help, for confidence. Father, for the, the support that maybe we have a hard time finding in this world. Father, I, I thank you for all the, the blessings uh, that we slept last night and got up this morning. Most of us haven't missed a meal in quite a number of years. But Father, help us to keep our focus on you to do the things that you want us to do. Thank you, Father, for each one who is here, each one who has joined us uh, on the internet, each one who will watch these videos later on. Father, help us to count our many blessings, name them one by one. Help us, Father, to know that you are Lord, that you have risen from the grave. Father, you are indeed the greatest blessing we'll ever receive. 
thank you for being with us. I pray, Father, that you would speak through me this morning and touch hearts and, and lives by your word and by your spirit. Thank you, Father. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking about zeal. Z-E-A-L, zeal. And we really started on this a couple weeks ago when we mentioned that God is a jealous God. And talked more about it last week. And I can't guarantee that we won't talk about it next week, although I have no idea what David Poling is going to preach about. But you never know what's going to crop up uh, in, in different devotions and, and such. When I opened Dave's devotion this morning, he used a scripture pretty prominently there that I'm going to use in my sermon today. And uh, some people accuse us of uh, working together on these things. I, I'm not that smart to work ahead like that, so I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe Dave's looking over my shoulder or something. But, but uh, when we talk about God being a jealous God, we're talking about him being zealous or having zeal for what's right and what's most beneficial to grow his kingdom, what's most beneficial to grow our lives. And God knows that if we're walking more closely with him and, and learning about him and, and drawing near to him, that that's the best thing for our lives. Because people are gonna walk through this, this life uh, any place from a very short amount of time to a very long amount of time by our standards, right? I, 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 met people recently who were 104 years old, for example. You know, that used to seem like an awful long time, but that was when I was much younger. Um, you know, we're talking about somebody that I think was 69 years old, and I said, yeah, I remember when that was pretty old, but that gets younger every day, you know? But God wants us to have the greatest blessing that there is, and that is to walk with him and to, to gain the benefit of his his knowledge, his perspective, the help from his spirit, all these kinds of things that help. And so God is zealous for us to have what's right in our lives, for us to be in his word, for us to be in prayer. All these things help build our lives and make them what he wants them to be. And he is zealous for that. Uh, so what is zeal? What is it exactly? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, that's the second word on my list here. You're exactly right, Paco. Yeah, um, the words that I listed uh, were uh, passion, enthusiasm, great energy, eagerness, the pursuit of a cause. And there are probably at least that many words, again, that you could come up with or that we'll even talk about this morning. But just to know that, that when we have a passion for something, that it shows and there are people that will respect your faith and mine just because of the passion that we have for Christ. Uh, enthusiasm, and, and these are interesting words to me. Uh, the word passion, um, you know the original meaning of passion of course was suffering. If you go to a passion play, and I guess up in Pennsylvania, there's a theater there that year round they do passion plays. And over in Germany, there's a pretty famous one that is at least five syllables that I don't really put in the right order when I say it. But a passion play is about the suffering of Jesus. And, and when people have passion, it means that, that they put their whole heart into what they're doing. And when Jesus put his whole heart into doing the will of God and bringing about what we needed, he suffered for it. And we do the same thing. And I suspect that many times Christians today are afraid to be too zealous for the Lord because their passion will show and other people will put us down for it. I find that when people put me down for my, my love for God, that's one of the best things that happens in my day because it means that I'm finally doing something right. Finally, somebody can see that, that I care about God. That doesn't make me perfect, far from it. But it means that, that we have God in us in a way that shows passion is very important in our faith. Enthusiasm originally was a word that indicated doing the will of God. 
And if you look at the word enthusiasm, and, and you can circle this in your Bible if you want, or even on your cell phone if you've got that up in, or your tablet. Don't circle it. But that, that middle syllable, well, not quite middle, but the, the second syllable, T-H-U, is God's name. God's name in Greek is theos, or the, 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 the word for God is theos, and enthusiasm is, is when God is in us that we have, we're excited. When, when God is in us, we have something that the rest of the world needs, the rest of the world doesn't have. We have something to share, something that, that is meaningful. And, and how many people get to uh, whatever old age is, maybe retirement, maybe later, uh, maybe even earlier, maybe midlife crisis, and, and whatever that is. And they look at their life and they say, have I made a difference? For me as a Christian, I don't have that problem. I see many times that the, the, this church or the churches that I've been with have made an impact in people's lives. I've seen so many times that, that God uses words that I speak. And so often, almost every time when somebody comes to me and says, wow, so glad you said this, so often it's something that wasn't in my notes. But there's a reason that we pray about these things and seek God's help it's because we want God to speak through us. Many times my prayer is, God, speak from your heart to theirs through mine. And so it's, it's not always the, the witty things that I write into my sermon. It's not usually those things. Usually the witty things that I say, are, they fall flat. You know, yeah, I say something real witty and then people yawn and lay down and get a good nap. Oh, whatever. But enthusiasm shows. Enthusiasm shares. And, and you know, there are going to be people that don't like us or don't like what we stand for. Good. It means they're paying attention. But if we don't stand for anything, if we don't stand up for God in, in the ways that he wants us to, and, and that means being smart about it. Um, you know, I, I've seen people um, every place from downtown Cincinnati, Ohio, to Times Square, New York, who are soapbox preachers. And the, 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 the mighty crowds in New York, not in Cincinnati. That was pretty dismal. But anyways, uh, by the way, if you've ever seen the TV show WKRP in Cincinnati, you know, at the beginning, they show that fountain, you know, that, that's where it was, Fountain Square there in Cincinnati. But nobody paying attention because nobody knows that person. Nobody knows that person's heart where they've come from and, and how God is using them. Um, but to know that we can share what God is, is doing in our lives in a way that draws people. You remember when Jesus was talking in the Sermon on the Mount and he said that we should be salt and light. You remember that part? That's not written into my notes so it won't go up on the screen here, but someplace there, Matthew 5 or 6. And when I think about us being light, if, if we take a, a pretty strong LED flashlight and shine it square into somebody's eyes, it doesn't help them much, does it? But if we take that light and even a dimmer one and shine it on the path, that helps. That guides, that keeps somebody from falling. If, if there's somebody there that's got a, a two pound steak or somebody's got a bag of popcorn and you've got a, a, a container of salt and you dump a pound of salt on their steak, that doesn't help, does it? You dump all that salt in their bag of popcorn. Eh, a lot of it will go to the bottom of the bag, but that ruins that too. You know, for us as Christians, we want to help people, not, not just to blast them. Not, not just to make us feel better, but to do something that will help that other person maybe see the truth in a new way. Now, they might not be ready for it. That's okay. But we need to have the zeal, the passion, the enthusiasm to share what we have. And it starts with living what we have. Uh, I've got this written in my notes a little bit later. I'm going to talk about it right now while I'm thinking about it. 
Sometimes I miss things in my notes. One of the things that concerns me sometimes is that we as Christians too often are way too political. And it's fine to be political. You are more than welcome to have your views. Your views might be different than mine. That's wonderful. We can talk about it. It's not going to be a church. And, and I'm not going to I'm not going to put it up on my Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter. I, I never post much on those anyways. I, I don't want people to see the political side of things. And too often politics get ugly. Too often politics is about domination and control and, and, and really being ugly to people that we don't like. Most of them we never met before. If somebody ever told me, you know, I was thinking about asking you about, about your Jesus, but then I saw this post that you made about our president or the previous president or the one before that or that, whatever. And so I figured, you know, if, if, if you can't, if you can't love them, how can you love God? How can you love me? Now, I've never had that experience because I don't post things and you're more than welcome to. But please realize that we have an impact and sometimes zeal can be wrong. It can be wrongly headed or wrongly, wrongly used. Well, let's take a look at a couple of scriptures that, that talk about zeal the right way, then, then we'll get into some that are the wrong way. Uh, Jeremiah 29 is a passage that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks. And um, as we were talking about it last week, verse 13 tells us that, that God is going to come back to them. They're going to come back to God when they seek God with all their hearts. That phrase, that, that verse just jumps out at me. Because too often, we get so busy, our lives get so kind of diluted down by, by details and by little struggles and big struggles and, and worrying about this and, you know, how can we take care of that? And the next thing you know, we realize that it's been weeks or months or years since we really focused on God and about God in, in my life or your life. And so when we seek God with all of our hearts, you know, that's a type of zeal. And that starts from within us. And that doesn't have a negative impact on, on anybody unless they, they hate anything about God or don't like the way we live our life for God. And again, that's fine. They're more than welcome to do that. Ephesians 6, 7 is another verse. Uh, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. And in our jobs, in our lives, you know, for our families, we, we need to serve wholeheartedly. We need to be about what will help others and what will show God in our lives. And so we have opportunities to live the passion, the enthusiasm, the eagerness, all these kinds of things that we've been talking about here to make certain that we're honoring the Lord. In Matthew chapter 10, there's a list of Jesus' disciples. I'm not going to take the time to read it right now. But down toward the end, uh, I think he's the next to last one, just before Judas is carried, <laughs> who betrayed him. Um, there's this guy named Simon. Now, this isn't the same as Simon Peter, um, but Simon the Zealot. And if you look at that word zealot, the first four letters are pretty obvious what this person or this group is all about zeal and the zealots were known to be kind of a political group that were um, a, a political action committee if you will all on their own and their desire was to kick Rome out and so they were working behind the scenes you kind of picture them sabotaging things and trying to make things difficult for the Romans so that they'll want to leave so that they won't want to be there to persecute as they would have seen it, the, the people of, of Jerusalem and Judea in that area. Isn't that interesting that one of Jesus' disciples was very politically involved and motivated? They must have had some wonderful discussions in that group as the zealot tried to get other people to join his cause. Now, do you think Jesus let him control the group? I don't think so. 
Jesus was very strong on knowing what his purpose was for being there, about knowing what God's will was. We'll talk about that in just a minute with a verse or two. But Simon the Zealot became much more a zealot for God. And you look at the other disciples, and a lot of times you look at them and you say, you know what, they, they just weren't all that. They weren't all that smart. They weren't all that together, all that committed, uh, committed or dedicated. I just about formed a new word there, didn't I? Communicated. Yeah. I can say it faster that way if I don't explain it. I wonder if his zeal is what appeals, uh, appealed to Jesus. Knowing that he could be so passionate, so enthusiastic, It's about like our second son, our Marine. If you look up strong-willed child in the dictionary, his picture's there still. <laughs> and Sharon and I would just shake our heads, spank him again, and um, we just realized at some point that if we continue to guide him and form him, you know, he's, he's a fine man. Today, still pretty strong-willed. We're gonna to get to have supper with he and his family tonight, going to North Carolina to do it, that's all right. But to know that God will use our personalities and our experiences, and so we, we don't have to be milk toast. We don't have to be mushy. Now, there are some things like temper, for example, that, that God can help us with, but sometimes it's good to be fiery, isn't it? But it's learning to stand up for the right thing in the right way. Well, I believe that we all should be zealots, but for the right cause, for the right person, and in the right ways, that it makes a positive impact. Well, let's take a look at a couple of wrong causes wrong uh, people who are zealous but in the wrong way in Acts chapter 4 uh, and chapters 3 and 4 are kind of a couplet together Peter and John are going up to the temple Peter says I don't have any money for the beggar but what I have I give you stand up and he stands up he's been lame his whole life now he can jump and run and a lot of excitement and so the people gather around and that gets the attention of the religious leaders and so when we look at Acts chapter 4, 1 through 4, it kind of comes full circle here. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees uh, came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believe grew to about 5,000. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were zealous. They were so intent on protecting their positions, their power and control, their, their streams of income, whatever that was. They had hated Jesus. They didn't mind turning him over to be put to death. They didn't like being blamed for it, so I'm sure they're still angry. And now Peter and John step up and they do a, 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 a parlor trick of some type here. This guy gets up and jumps and runs around and the people are, are all smitten with it because they're like sheep anyways, right? Just ask these religious leaders, they'll tell you all these things. But they're zealous to protect themselves and their place. I find that sometimes in churches, people get to that same place. Uh, one of the churches that I worked with had deaconesses. Deaconess is a female servant. Praise God for the ladies that, that serve. But we had a church board. And I've never found that in scripture any place. And so you ended up with um, people that wanted certain positions as deacon or deaconess especially. Not as much elder, but there was some of that maybe. But they wanted to be in the know, and they wanted to be in the say-so. Now again, I'm not blaming everybody or accusing everybody. 
when it came right down to it, unless somebody said something about it, I, I don't know people's hearts that well. Although sometimes you watch action. But there are things about human nature that we have to watch out for. And we need to make sure that our hearts are right and that we're serving God and that we kind of keep evaluating. And that means praying about it and asking God for help. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about himself. And it, it's a fascinating passage because in Philippians 1, he's talking about people that are going out preaching the gospel to try to make him jealous because he's in, in jail and he can't get out and preach. And so some people are actually trying to make him jealous by preaching. He kind of laughs. Well, it doesn't say that, but I, I kind of sense that. And says, hey, whether right motives are wrong, as long as they're getting the message out. Well, in Philippians 3, he talks about himself and his past. Starting with verse 4. Uh, if anyone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Ooh. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider them loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, rubbish in some translations, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, you know, I, I had it all. He was an up and comer in Judaism amongst the, the leadership if you remember, end of Acts chapter 7, beginning of 8, they were going to stone Stephen to death for his blasphemy. They laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's him. He is recognized as representing the Sanhedrin, if not a member of the Jewish high court, Sanhedrin. He says, now I look back and I realize that that garbage was blinding my eye to where God really wanted me to go and to be. A lot of people aspire to high position. God don't care. That's not what it's about. You know, the old saying about, you know, the person who climbed the ladder of success only to find it was leaning against the wrong wall. Kind of just describes Saul right here. Paul learned to be content. He, he learned to be strengthened by what God was doing in him and through him. He didn't have the titles. He didn't have the recognition. When he says he suffered the loss of all things, some people believe that that included a marriage. Because to be on the Sanhedrin, he would have had to have been married. Later on, he talks about traveling. You know, our Barnabas and I are the only ones who are not permitted to travel with a wife. Kind of, kind of comments, you know. Many believe that when, when Paul was younger, he got married and his wife was as on fire for her Judaism as Saul was with his. You can come down on either side of that. The point is, whatever he had, he was willing to give up so that he made sure that he knew, knew Jesus and was with him for all of eternity. Well, what about the right thing? What about the right thing or things to be zealous about? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 13. Part of this is a quote from the 34th Psalm. Uh, finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. That's a pretty good uh, to-do list for today, isn't it? Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. 
because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Ah, so bless others so that God can, all right, I get it. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Now, why did I read this whole passage? I could have just read that last verse. Be eager to do good. It's because it's not enough to be motivated. There has to be right motivation. There has to be right action with it. We've already talked about how when we're going to share our faith, it's important that we grow inside first. They grow in the way that we live. Now, we don't have to wait till we're perfect. If we do, well, that'll never happen. But if we see God at work in us, and, and, you know, I've had people tell me when I've been talking to them about Jesus, well, you're not perfect. I don't have a problem acknowledging that. It's not about me being perfect because it's not about my righteousness. It's not about me keeping the Ten Commandments or keeping the law to try to be saved. It's got to be about what God has done for me through his son Jesus on the cross. And then by placing his spirit inside of us and giving his word to us, we have the opportunity to grow and to change, to become people that when they see our passion, our enthusiasm, our eagerness to do good, as verse 13 says here, When I was in high school, I went to a, a, a government camp called uh, Boys State that the uh, American Legion, I think it was, put on. The mythical 51st state. I was elected to the Board of Governors for Wayne State University that week, thank you very much. Power. It all went away after three days. One of the guys that was a new friend, there were about three guys that I hung around with, they, we were assigned to the same city. In other words, stayed on the same floor at Michigan State University. And by the way, keep Michigan State in your prayers. Uh, my folks live about oh, five miles from the edge of Michigan State campus. But after about the second day, one of the guys said, you don't swear, do you? Well, I was about 16 at the time. Maybe, maybe it was the summer I turned 17. And if he would have hurt my mouth when I was 13. Not just bad words. I mean, bad words are bad enough, I guess, but abusive, foul, dirty jokes. And the other guy, that was, we were playing cards at the time. The other guy looked at me and he laughed and he said, eh, I guess I've sworn enough for all three of us, huh? <laughs> he had, I didn't put him down for it. You know, he, he had found what I had found. And it's not that my, again, I, I can say it a hundred times a sermon. It's not that I was perfect at that point, far from it. It took me a while to get my mouth cleaned up and a lot of the external things. And then I discovered that the hard work was what was inside. Thoughts, attitudes, ways of thinking about people, even if I was too Christian to say it out loud. <laughs> but God me, we worked on it. I needed him to help me. Because all the zeal in the world, if it's not accompanied with the right outlook, you know, uh, striving to keep my tongue from evil, my lips from deceitful speech, trying to do good, trying to seek peace and pursue all the things that were in that passage in 1 Peter 3. Well, how about Titus chapter 2? Titus is one of those New Testament books. Maybe you read Titus every couple of days or so, but I, I don't always. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Uh, by the way, it says upright, not uptight lives. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. Do, do you kind of get the feeling that I like type certain words into my search engine, like uh, eager to do good? It helps. So learning to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, instead to let God live within us. Let's go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is a quick one. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Um, if you look at, at the passage here, he's been uh, talking about different gifts all through the 12th chapter. And, and the reason that Paul's talking about these gifts is because the Corinthian church abused them. It's like, hey, if, if I can speak in tongues, then you know, I'm, I'm a better Christian than all of you. And if I can prophesy, and if I call myself an apostle or, or whatever. Okay. So after Paul talks about all those, and, and you know, we, uh, we don't pursue those kinds of gifts today, do we? But the opportunity to make an impact for Jesus is not about titles or not about those specifics. It's, it's about desiring the greater gifts. What is he talking about there? Well, this is the last verse of chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 13 is about... Love. Yes, it's about love. And when we go to the end of chapter 13, which is only 13 verses later, and Paul says, for now there remain these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so when he says at the end of chapter 12, pursue the greater <laughs> gifts, that's what he's talking about. Now, at that time in the church, there was nothing wrong with any of those gifts, and there are still functions of, of, of some of those today. We certainly need those who share the message. That's what an apostle, small a, was and is. We need teachers, and that's mentioned in there. We need the work of the Holy Spirit, whether it is accompanied by tongues or not, to know that God's Spirit is at work in our hearts and, and in our lives. But we need to desire, eagerly desire, the greater gifts. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And of course, 2 Corinthians 9 is about... We don't know this one quite as well. It's about giving. Uh, chapters 8 and 9, as Paul talks to them, uh, and, and it's interesting because the giving is more about giving the heart than it is financially, but there's certainly that too. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2, there's no need for me to write you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help. And I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. Okay, so... There were a lot of needs. They were going to take an offering and send the money to the Christians in Jerusalem, Judea, because there were famines there. That a lot of the people were impoverished, and they were going to help. It was going to be a way to bridge cultural gaps and re former religious gaps between the Gentiles and the Jews within the church. And so it's an opportunity for them to work together. And so you notice what, what Paul says there about the, uh, the enthusiasm that they had and the 
uh, the, the passion that they had for giving and how that helped others. Well, a little bit farther down in the passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all you need will abound in every good work. And so being enthusiastic about obeying the Lord, being enthusiastic about blessing others, means that blessings will come to us. Now the blessings might not be dollar for dollar. I heard a guy say once long ago that if you give God $10, he'll give you $20 back. And I thought, now this is a, 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 a scam I can get behind, you know? You know, okay, well, I'm gonna cash my paycheck and put that in the offering, and then when God gives me double that, I'll put that in next week's offering. You know, within a few months, I'll be so wealthy, I can just, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, if I could find that in the Bible, I'd tell you about it, but I just, if I could tell you any place where that worked, I'd tell you about that too, but. We need to be abounding in every good work. And that, that may be helping your neighbor, something that nobody at church ever sees. God sees, God knows. There are lots of opportunities out there. Hebrews chapter 10 is a, is a great chapter, verses 32 through 39. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. Now, don't we all want that? Don't you look forward to suffering so that you can learn these lessons? And I think we go through enough that we can uh, learn lessons, right? For paying attention. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. What does that mean, shrink back? Well, we're back to that whole milk toast, uh, fearful thing. Instead of knowing that God is with us and we are with him. And that there are a lot of times that people might hate on us for our faith and for sharing it, but I suspect a lot of times people respect the desire to, to share what we know is true. Now that was a zealous cry. I mean, I know. <laughs> it, it was enthusiastic, that's right. <laughs> Let's go to Acts chapter 4. I think we kind of started there, didn't we? As Paul Harvey would have said, and now the rest of the story. I can't do his Arkansas accent, I'm sorry. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices and said, Oh no, I hope that never happens to me. Oh, well, this is a different translation. <laughs> they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea, everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your, uh, your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats 
and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and was distributed to everyone who had need. Their zeal, their enthusiasm, their passion got into their daily lives. I've heard of churches that had Miracle Day offerings where people brought the deeds to property, brought motorcycles to church to give to the church, things that were sold millions of dollars in some cases that were raised because the church needed more more building, more meeting space, whatever the cause was, they looked to the Lord through his people. And for us to have zeal, and again, sometimes the zeal is a cup of cold water in his name. Sometimes it's helping someone with a cardboard sign. I love the little cartoon where, you know, it's obviously back in caveman days and the guy's holding the sign that says, we'll hunt for food. <laughs> oh, you'll all be laughing in the car on the way home. Come on. <laughs> in Acts chapter 5. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin. This is the next time they get arrested. And more of them get arrested this time. It's like, oh, we couldn't shake those two guys. If we get all of them, maybe they'll, they'll go away. Made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, they said. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. I can't figure out why. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. Maybe that's why. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now down to verse 41 to 42. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You'd have thought when the powers that be were aligned against them, that they would have went and hid in a hole someplace. I, I, I'm not a prophet. Lord knows some days I just like to make a prophet, you know. But what I've seen in this country and in our culture over the last 30 to 50 years is that more persecution is coming for Christians. Now, do I feel my life is at risk right now? No, not at all. But there's a lot of crazy people out there and some of them have guns and whatever, but oh, I've, I've, I've always felt if, if I lose my life serving God, you can shout hallelujah at my funeral. I'm fine with that. I don't pursue it. I, I don't seek it. But to, to be able to suffer for his name, it means we're doing something right. And, and I'm not suggesting that we go out and be intentionally obnoxious or so direct that people can't do anything but, but hate us. But Jesus said that they hated him, so they were going to hate us too. It's all about, about spirituality, and it's about hope and, and the promise of eternal life. And 
Those things that a lot of folks just don't see yet. So where does our zeal come from? Part of it comes from Jesus. In John chapter 2, you remember the story? He went into the temple and they were selling things and they were making people exchange their money for real money, their money. In other words, if they came from Greece, uh, the, the Jewish people that came to the temple and they had drachma, oh, well, you can't spend those here to buy an animal to sacrifice over here. You know, you, you got to go over here and exchange those for shekels. Oh, okay. So they go over and exchange their money and they come back. Now they've got to buy a, a, a lamb or, or a goat or whatever, a, a dove that they're going to sacrifice, depending on what type of sacrifice they were making. And all of a sudden, it really is uh, about twice as expensive or three times as expensive. And they lost some money on the exchange and they're getting ripped off. And some people are making a lot of money by serving God. Uh, my, my friend Jeff over in Hampton was talking to somebody a while back. And the person said, well, they weren't going to go to church because of all these preachers driving Cadillacs and Mercedes. And Jeff just started laughing. Uh, at that time, I think I was driving a 1997 uh, Saturn. And I don't know if it was an S or an SL. And I don't think anybody cared what other letter was there. It didn't persuade the man to come to church, by the way, that I drove an old car. And my car now is just getting good. Hope I don't lose another wheel cover anytime soon. But actually, I didn't lose it; it's in the trunk. But that's that's a whole other set of stories. Jesus said, "This is my Father's house. It's a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves." And they noted from Psalm sixty-nine that that the zeal of the Lord consumed him. And he needed to show them that what they're doing was wrong. And it, it definitely set up conf confrontation. But he never seemed to shy from that. Well, how about, uh, how about I turn the page? There we go. How about Luke chapter 9? I mentioned this earlier. And there's nothing wrong with the NIV, New International Version, or other translations. But I really like what the American Standard Version uh, from 1901, the way it's worded. And to me, it's more accurate than the NIV. And it came to pass, when the days were well nigh come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay, that well nigh come means the days were coming close for him to go to the cross. And when it says that he resolutely or steadfastly set his face, it meant that nothing was going to persuade him or dissuade him from going to, to Jerusalem. Nothing would take away from him going to the cross. He came to this life to do the, the, the will of the Father. He came to this life to give us eternal life and forgiveness of sins, and nothing was going to stop him. And it was offensive to the people around him. You read this passage. And, and the, uh, I, I guess it was the uh, Samaritans are trying to welcome him or welcome him back, I guess. You remember John chapter 4. And when, when they say, no, he's not going to stay here. He's on his way to Jerusalem. You know, uh, look at his face. He set his jaw. You know, he's just going and he's going to get to Jerusalem and nothing will stop him. And they were offended by that. Well, they wanted to be good hosts and hostesses and whatever. Nothing would stop him. He gets to Jerusalem and he goes through various trials. Let's go to Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, that's James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was going to accomplish God's purpose no matter what. 
I see zeal in what he did there. I see enthusiasm because God is in what he's doing and nothing will stop him. I see the opportunity for us as we walk through this life to live just a little bit more out loud for him. Let the world know that they can have the hope in the promise of eternal life that we have. What is your passion? What are you willing to suffer for, for God? Let's be zealous for him. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Father, I, I ask that you would help us to have the boldness that they had in Acts chapter 4, that after they realized that there was nothing that those in power could do to them, but Father, what you would do in them was so important. Help us to share the good news because there are so many who don't know Jesus. Some of them are people we love, some are people we like, some are people we hate. Many are those we don't know. Help us, Father, to look at people through your eyes and to see that they need Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Are there any announcements, anything else that needs to be said today? All right. Keep, keep praying. Keep lifting up the name of, of the Father. Thank you.